cloud. So this is the uh, what I'm starting to call the research and scientific uh, open sourced software working group. Um, just because research is, I think, from a conversation I had with uh, Dan and Gre okay, now this is sorry. I have to learn how to share with multiple monitors. Um, now I have to move my camera because the camera's in the middle of. Well, never mind. All right, I'll just do my best here. Um, <clears throat> so just a reminder, uh, I created a Slack. I couldn't find science because I'd saved it in my favorites list this morning. So I errantly created a second channel, which I will delete after this. The current lead, the current links are, uh, the correct links are here. So I apologize for that. Um, so uh, a lot of high... So I'm curious about the projects that people are working on now, but I'll uh, focus on um, when I was looking at the this here because we've talked about this before, and I was I was reflecting on discussions that I've had with many of you over the course of the last years, uh, and with others, of course, uh, really over the course of the like period before the pandemic. So 2018, 2019, and then everything went away, virtualized for a while. And this this collaboration with open source research and scientific software slowed a bit. Um, however, so when I think about, when I look at this frame, this frame struck me, and this is just me. So I welcome criticism or just throwing me down the stairs on this if if this thought process is not quite right. This kind of reflects, I think, a chaos perspective really well on how we think about uh, open source software health and sustainability, generally speaking. So we think about community growth, stewardship, maintenance, ecosystem management. But when I was reflecting on the kinds of questions and concerns that I'd heard from scientists in particular who build this software, I, I framed, I I thought of a different frame with the thing in the center is trying to understand the PI's perspective, because one of the things I've heard over time is that there are uh, really the software gets generated in the most, in most, in many cases, perhaps not most, but in many cases for advancing the science and uh, of course, publication. And the notion of sustaining a community isn't always in the fore foreground of what people who build research and scientific software are already thinking about. And I think software maintenance is viewed as kind of a cost center or this labor and uh, stewardship, I think perhaps takes a different frame in open source research and scientific software, where we think about what are the patterns of how this software evolved and what are the anti-patterns? Dan's got a question, excellent. I can show. No, I, I, I don't have a question. Just when when you finish, I just wanted to. I was going to respond to some stuff, but it's it's. I, sh I should let you finish first, though. I just. No, I, I just... think I'm. I th I was pretty much done, Dan. So, let's let's go. Okay. Well, so I, I was going to say that I, from my point of view, and the way I've thought about this, and the way I've talked to funders about this as well, is that there's kind of two two ways that scientific software starts. Um, one is that somebody has a problem and they need to build software to solve their problem. And, and so they get funding to do that in some way, or they have funding to, to do the research and they use some of that funding to build the software. Um, and, and the other way is that somebody has an idea for something that they think is gonna be useful to a lot of people. And they then try to get funding to do, to do that. And so one of these is right, a software that's intended to address a person, uh, the researcher's needs directly first. And, and the other is software that's intended to address a community's needs. And so, in the case of somebody that's writing software for themselves, at some point they they start to think like, this is useful for me, maybe it would be useful for somebody else as well. And then they have to kind of make a decision. Do they actually want to change what they're doing and not focus on the research as much, but focus on the software and the software sustainability and building a community and all those other things? Or do they just want to keep the software because what they want to do is their own research and it's it's, if somebody else asks for it, maybe they'll give it to them, but they're not going to put a lot of effort into it. Um, so I so I think that there's like these two different starting points, and then one of them can lead to the second one, but it doesn't have to. Right. And are 
Are we so, concerned so I, about both of these paths or both of these kinds of software? Or are we centrally focused on one or the other? I think it depends on who we are. Um, yeah, I think us in, here. Well, so I think in the case of like the, the, the Corsa project, we're focused on both of them. But in the case of chaos, maybe it's much more the the community one. So, so I, I'd add a third one. I think I don't know if it fits into these, but there's the institutional software, you know, like uh, you know, facility, uh, like a scientific facility, has to develop software to run the instrument or to process the data or whatever. Um, that's not really in either of those cases. Uh, well, maybe it's the second one. I don't know. I, I would have said it's actually the first one. Well, it's not really an individual. It's it's an organization. Um, yeah, but it, it but it's intended to solve a specific problem as like for for the people that are developing it, or or for their users or their customers. It's right. It's not. I I don't. I mean, in some cases, maybe it's it could be the second one as well. It, it, I think it depends a little bit. Are they right? So is the facility building the software to make the facility better? Or is the facility building the software because they think it's going to make the community do better work outside of the facility as well? I, I don't think, know. That's just my opinion. So, but maybe maybe it is different. I don't know. It, well, I think I think what happens is that it starts off with the former. So, in other words, they want to make the facility, you know, more functional for its users, uh, and you know, be able to produce good science. But then it gets to the point where they realize that there's other facilities that are doing similar stuff and that we can probably collaborate and share and leverage and all that kind of stuff. And so building a community outside that becomes more uh, more useful to them. So in, in that case, I, I again, I would say that that's basically the the first one that I said, but it's it's a slightly it's a slight variation on it, but it's 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 similar that right that somebody is building the software for, themselves it's just the, the the person and themselves as a facility as opposed to an individual researcher and dan can you remind me what corsa is i know the acronym but I, i'm drawing a blank this morning because i haven't had enough coffee yet so i i actually don't remember what the acronym stands for but it's the doe funded project that greg and i and dana are on okay right this center looking... center for open source research software advancement there's actually another word in there but i'm dropping it i'm just putting i'm, I'm making <laughs> making it fit the <laughs> angle <laughs> there's stewardship in there as well but it's really yeah center for open source research software advancement i think will do okay i'll make a note of that but yeah, as Dan Dan mentioned, it's a it's a DOE funded effort, um, and it's part of a bigger uh, project. Actually, it's one part of a, a much larger project that is is really focused on uh, the stewardship of the sustainability and stewardship of DOE software, primarily. So. When we look at the within facilities uh, or somebody identifying the problem and building software to solve it, are those a, a different set of, it seems that they might be a different set of goals and objectives than moving to this point of community. And I'm wondering if the questions that we ask about that software's health and sustainability are different than the ones that we ask when when we talk about the community or software that goes across many facilities because i think in the chaos project we we do have this sort of predisposition to think about community as a critical part of growing a uh, highly scalable software and i one of the distinctions i think i have observed between these two paths that uh, dan and greg described is that there might be different questions that get asked along each of them yeah, when you're trying I, to assess the health. I don't think there's any question about that, that they're, they're different. I mean, I think the main thing, though, is that the, 
people that are people or facilities that are in this first group may end up transitioning into the second. It's this is kind of what um, uh, James Hallison has studied that like in the uh, transition to peer production, I think is what he calls it. Yeah, or, yeah. Or, NSF funds lots of things, and some of them get into the state where they become community projects. Some of them don't, but that doesn't mean that the software itself isn't good. It just means that the people that are funded didn't make that choice to get into the into the second part, into the second option. Would it be easier, Sean, to take notes in the document? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure it would be. I'm, That's a good I'm point, John. I'm going to lose these notes. Yeah. Um, Let me. Uh, co I'll copy and paste these into the. Thank you, Don. Yeah. Doesn't most research funding these days require that people share their software or make it available? Yeah, but that's completely different than making a community or or scaling it or anything else. That's adding a license and sticking it on GitHub. I mean, most of the time where I've seen people write software, but it really splits it up as was this software designed to be generally used or not, right? I've seen lots of professors who have some person in their lab who writes some software and it's really just designed to be a one-off. So there's never going to really be a community around it. It's like some bespoke thing that doesn't integrate well and wasn't really designed to build in general on multiple compilers and stuff like that. And then there's stuff that was designed to be a shareable thing from the get-go. And to, like, to me, like institutional software is kind of in the latter case where it's like, yeah, maybe it just lives in some institution, but it's designed to be something that's going to be maintained, that's going to last longer than one graduate student or, you know, some small or some research grant or something like that. The stuff in the formal, I, I feel, is often very ephemeral. It's like some research, some grad student wrote something and it's going to live as long as they're in the research group, as long as the grant goes on. And then after that, it's just maybe it's on GitHub, but it's an unmaintainable mess and no documentation or anything like that. I, I think it's I think it's actually different than that. Sorry, I, I was trying to post a talk into the chat, but um, I don't think I can attach a file in chat. And this is a talk yeah. on the website, unfortunately. So, um, but but I think like an example that I give of the of the first one is the code that I worked on as a graduate student that was code my advisor wrote originally, and it stuck around for twenty years through lots of generations of graduate students. Um, and it was never intended to be a community code. It was always intended to be like a small group of people working collectively where right, different graduate students would add different features, but it would kind of be the same code that would stick around and keep getting better and better. But it, but it was never an open community. It was just this little community of grad students and the advisor. Mm -hmm. um, and it was not open source ever, right? It, yes. It, there, there are other people that were working on competing codes that took the other path and, and started in the same place and then made their software open source. So it's, you know, I feel like it was just a choice that like my advisor didn't want to do that. He wanted to keep it as a kind of as a trade secret that would help him, him and his students, whereas other people kind of chose the other path to, to help the community as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. That's how most of what I worked on as a grad student was. It was all internal stuff that was like kind of secret ish. And there was eventually some stuff turned into like a website that they eventually started selling through Thermo. But for the most part, it was stuff that we had and it was internal. It was on our hidden subversion server and not open. So I would, Dan and um, Dana, I would, I would presume the internal not open software is not in the domain of the course of project, for example, or is it? Well, I mean, to me, right, like, I, I think it should be. Because so if people are using this software and they really have low software quality, like, for example, if they consume a lot of supercomputer hours by having their software crash and burn and just, you know, waste time, right, then, then that, that affects all of us. So we should be concerned about that. Or if they have buggy software, it's untested. I mean, look how many papers got retracted because that guy flipped the sign, right, doing crystallography. I mean, that was like what a half dozen high profile crystal structures. And that's kind of a big deal. So even if people have kind of their own bespoke stuff, it's important that people understand good software engineering so they don't make dumb mistakes and pollute the literature with trash. But I would say that, I mean, 
our primary focus is on open source yeah, software. Yeah. And and if I mean, if there are things that you know need to be done that are specifically related to to private you know software, then I don't I don't think we really want to get involved in that. But if there's things that, you know, relate to open source software that they can use, you know, for their software, then great. But I don't want to be developing, you know, metrics or something that specifically target, uh, um, you know, private repositories of software. Oh, yeah. 100%. I mean, yeah, we should be focusing on on open source, but we should also, I mean, I just, I realized that I know that when, like, my stuff's all BSD licensed. So I know that there's my stuff exists in tons of proprietary software around the world. But um, but those people are kind of my customers too, right? So. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is partly, at least in my case, this is a difference between work stuff that was done in a, in a lab, university lab 30 years ago and how stuff would be done today. Mm -hmm. um, right, where, where open source just wasn't as much of a concept in scientific software as it is now. I, I think the other, uh, the other thing I was just gonna add is that um, I guess that if we think about uh, open source and research software, there's they're right they're overlapping, but they're not the same. And so, if if somebody's thinking about research software in general, they have to recognize that open source is not always the way that people go. Or right? sometimes people do commercialized things. Sometimes they they do something else. Um, kind of like open source and scientific software are not the same thing either. So, and I think that. Yeah, the con the contrast or the the thing I was in my mind trying to tease out with these questions is, are there, you know, one of the things chaos can help do with the software and metrics we have is sort of go through a large portfolio and identify the projects that have a scale that may benefit from the development of a community around it and other projects that are already in that scale and uh, perhaps then again, this these earlier projects where, you know, where the somebody identifies a problem and builds on it or where it's focused only within a facility and maybe those projects are okay just staying that way because that's the scope of what they do. But the questions about how to sustain them may be different or I think are likely to be different. And I, how would we want, how would this group like to think about that or focus on it and i welcome being redirected entirely from this thought i mean so i think one one thing that maybe comes up here is like if we think about open source projects that are joining a foundation um there's often a, a requirement that they have to have uh, people from a bunch of organizations to be to be able to do that and and on the other hand some of the some of the smaller pieces of software that are intended as community don't have people from multiple organizations. They mostly have one organization that's supporting it, and and that organization may be getting funding to do that. So I so I kind of feel like that's maybe a a little bit of a difference. Is are the are the owners kind of willing to spread out ownership, or do they feel like they want to kind of keep it? And part of that's related to scale, but part of it's also just related to funding and motivation incentives and other things. So for the course of project, are you interested in both of those cases or only in the first one where the projects are interested in scale? Like, are we, are we wanting to think about or develop metrics and approaches metric models uh, analysis that addresses both cases or I, I mean I guess I would say for me and and Greg may have a completely different opinion is that we we kind of want to try to push organization uh, projects to to the to the larger scale in terms of ownership and contribution um, because part of what we're trying to do is to is to get them into foundations and to get community that's going to support them because effectively we don't think they can all be supported by DOE only directly. 
And so this seems like the only option in some ways that's going to lead to the software being sustained. Um, but I don't think that means that we necessarily ignore the others because there's going to be some of them as well. But I'd be interested in what Greg says too. I would say, yeah, I would say that our focus is on the second group um, because um, they're the they're the projects that are in our scope or in the scope of all the SSOs, uh, you know, the other organisations that are part of this larger organisation that we're a part of. Um, and we need to understand how... So they're, they're all, you know, they're, they're, they're multi institution multi-person projects they're open source they have some degree of sustainable sustainability and funding already um, but you know ultimately we need to understand how to make those projects more sustainable um, or how, how they make themselves more sustainable um, but I agree with Dan is that, yeah, there's there's these other projects that are not in that position at the moment that could benefit from uh, from the same, you know, essentially they're just different metrics, right? I mean, if if one of the metrics is uh, how many contributors there are on a project, these are the these are the ones that have one contributor or something, right? versus one that have ten contributors. so it's 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 a different. Uh, the projects are really just different by some kind of metrics that do relate to the sustainability of those projects. Um, so I don't, I don't think it, we want to exclude them. Um, and certainly we want to help them. Uh, but, but I think for Corsa, it's really more on the, on the projects that are already uh, established, isn't it? You know, that, that have communities already and how to, how to keep them going. Because that's what DOE is really interested in. Yeah, I'm. I I think that that's mostly right, but I'm not completely sure that that's that it's completely right. Because I think I think that there are DOE projects that don't have a community already that would DOE would like to kind of push into getting a community and and then using that to keep going. Yeah, that that may be the case. I mean, part of the thing is we don't really know all the projects at this point. You know, we don't have a catalogue of every single project and and it's a set of metrics, <laughs> uh, so we don't know. Um, you know, I think I think if there were projects, you know, that only have uh, very small communities that are part of our of the scope of of this DOE effort, then yeah, we should definitely have metrics and things that can help them. Hmm. I, I think I think it helps to identify these these differences and then I think it, uh, we can make deliberate choices about there must be some threshold at which the course of project and other folks focused on open source scientific software recognize a project will benefit from these this evolution in the community. And surely I've seen other projects that you kind of know are just going to live in a lab and they'll be open source, but there might be very limited interest in it. So what would we, where do we want to, so if for focusing on these larger projects that do have community are there what um what do you want what do you think we should focus on so i i, I guess i if we're if we are going to focus on those i feel like we should focus on them still in like two ways right mm -hmm. ones that are just kind of getting into that and then ones that are that are kind of in that state and are right and we're we're, we're in some sense one question is how do you know if you're going to be successful soon? And, and the other one is how do you kind of stay successful in the longer term? Uh, sorry, and successful, I mean, in getting a community and sustaining yourself. Yeah, in a sense, uh, I mean, the way I see it is that there is like a spectrum of sustainability, you know, from, from a new project, you know, that, 
is starting up or a project that's not very sustainable or you know is is looking pretty iffy at the moment that, that's down one end to other projects which you know have really well established communities and they have funding and they have hundreds of people involved and big user bases and you know they're pretty they're pretty solid already at the other end um and there's this kind of spectrum of where all the projects sit on that uh, continuum and that's that's what I would like to, you know, I'd like to have something that shows projects where they are on that continuum and how to to move towards the the end that is more, you know, robust and, and long viable in the long term. That's I think it, one of the biggest threats to these projects, regardless of size, is, is resources. Is where does this come from? I mean, I just was on an NSF panel where we're looking at that software and there's, there's really big communities that get in trouble, right? The gigantic GitHub repo, tons of people throwing into it and stuff like that. But, you mm -hmm. know, it's maintained by some core cadre of, of people that are that are there all the time. And sometimes you just wind up with uh, people, a whole bunch of people leave at one time to go to industry because like suddenly, oh, AI is a thing now. And then a bunch of people disappear and go work for NVIDIA. And now there's this gap. And now this critical software has nobody to work on it, but also just like funding, right? Like bigger projects require more resources. And where does that money come from, right? Especially in open source communities where the cost of it is free. I mean, how many people fire up Python and pandas and NumPy and do a bunch of data science and think, wow, this is all free. This is great, but I should be paying for this somehow. Most people don't, they just use it. And so where does all that cash come from? If you lose a benefactor, then that, that can really stress a, a critical piece of software. And that is, that is, I think, more of a, an issue in the scientific and research software space because corporatized open source does have that funding mechanism. I see Addie yeah. has her hand up and has been very oh. patient. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I was very curious about, because I think these are all very good questions, right? But I was hoping a lot of experience that Chaos has is about all these different kinds of matrix, right? And then something that uh, Greg already mentioned, so I'll follow on from there, which is, you know, looking into where they are on a spectrum. Now, the spectrum could be sustainability funding wise, it could be quality of code, it could be whether they already have a community or need to establish one. But I was sort of hoping to find a smaller set of chaos matrix that maybe we could apply on some sample of the projects that are within our purview to, to kind of get a feel of where they fall and then maybe start the questions from that point. Maybe that will help us focus uh, a little bit more our discussions as per, you know, maybe that will naturally tell us, do they have communities or do they not? And, uh, and we are also making some assumptions because we're not familiar with each and every one. Some of us are familiar with some software packages more than others. So that was sort of like what I wanted to say, but I think everybody sort of already chipped in with some of this. Don, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I know you've started to do some thinking about, about the application of chaos metrics in this space and I don't know how much you can share or feel you can share but yeah I mean we have we have some we have some starter project health metrics which I think Addy is familiar with because I ran this on some of the Oak Ridge National Labs um repos so that's that's kind of us that's that's one of the things we use as a starting point and the purpose of that is to get people thinking about what other metrics they might need we could certainly put together a smaller you know, list of of metrics that might be might be useful. I mean, I think I think part of the exercise that Sean's going through, and I know it's a little bit painful because it just uh, I I'm not sure that we really have connected it to um, to the metrics, but I think it's trying to understand what the problems you're having are, so that we can better understand what metrics might be um, useful for you. But it might be helpful too if you have some some topics that that you want to understand. Um, let, me, let me back up a little bit. I, I had this conversation with with Greg, I think, the other day. Um, when when we think about metrics, uh, we could measure lots of things, right? I could put together a random list of metrics, and we could we could measure some stuff. Um, but 
what really helps is to put together a list of what you're trying to accomplish and what the what the goals are and then and then that can help us figure out how do we how do we measure whether or not we're successful so you know what are the key components of sustainability that you're looking for for example within projects some of some of that i think can help us put together a better list of of metrics for for what you're trying to achieve because because right now i don't think we have enough of an understanding of what you're trying to do within the course of project to be able to you know suggest the best metrics i think i think we need to kind of figure that out together and i'm not sure the best way to do that i'm sure i agree with you don and i think it will be our process because part of our project is to explore that exactly so we also don't have a starting point of that but as you must have noticed like the common arc of things and everybody speaking a lot of it was community and mm -hmm. you know if I look at uh, uh, Chaos's website, you do have some things that you classify as community matrix. So I was just curious if we take something like that and the matrix that you've already identified are associated with community and apply that on some of the projects. Now, this may not be in the automated system you can set up. This may be maybe matrix we need to manually look into. But just trying to identify that if community is an important aspect of what really DOE wants each uh, software to establish, then can we try out some matrix and see what the health of maybe different projects are? So I mm -hmm. think community is certainly gonna be an important one and I'm sure we're gonna come up with uh, with various different ones, but I was very interested in matrix that Chaos has already identified belongs to a certain category. If we could pick that category and see, yeah, community, that would be very interesting to all of the projects. Can we look at some of these matrix and see how we can actually work with projects. Maybe some of that has to be interview with the projects to ask some of the community matrix questions. So, so that's kind of where I was going with that. I'm pretty sure that it would be complicated to understand all the matrix that the projects will need to track, but maybe we can start from a category or two, in addition to like the ones that are set up in Augur and automated. Were, were the four metrics that I used for, um... Or now were those were those helpful? Were any of them more helpful than others? Are those the types of things we should start with, or do we need something completely different? So I think um, um, that is probably a question still left to be answered because we have to also engage with those projects because we're also sort of like a facilitation team. So we really need to find out what the projects need and if they find those useful. So that is some of the exercise that we have to do on our end to find out if the, the project teams find those things useful. I think it's useful for us to see some of those matrix, but if it actually goes back to the project team, that exercise we haven't done yet. I'm gonna put my hand up because Dan's had his hand up. So I'm gonna let him Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I was just going to call on Dan. There we go. Dan, go first. So I, I guess I was going to kind of make two slightly different points, um, but related. One, one being that I think what we're actually interested in, or the, or the only thing that we really know that we're interested in, actually is sustainability. Um, and that's, and so, and I also don't know that we think we can predict that necessarily. So it's something that we can look at and say, right, this project has been sustained and it's that's successful and maybe we can look at characteristics then and say if we could apply these characteristics to other projects then that would make it probable that they also would be sustained um but we don't really have like a cause and effect thing here that we know we just have kind of correlation so i think that's one of the the challenges is what like what are those points that that seem to correlate with success that we can encourage other projects to use to hopefully become successful um the other thing that i was going to kind of say is that, and this may be a difference, I, well, this may be a difference between most scientific software and some non-scientific software is, I feel like funding is really an important thing to look at here. Um, my guess is that for most open source software, somebody's being paid to work on it and that there's yes. very little that's entirely volunteer based. Um, but the models of how people are getting paid, I think, varies a lot between general open source software and scientific software. And so I think kind of looking at that in some detail and trying to understand that is probably going to be somewhat useful as well. Like not, not necessarily just who's funding it, but is it 
is it grant funded? Is it industrial funded? Is it funded for the purpose of sustaining the software? Is it funded for the purpose of doing work with the software? Is it funded because the software is needed by the person that's actually funding under the organization that's funding it? So, so I think there's going to be some questions kind of around not just where funding comes from, but what the intent of funding is and how it's applied that may be worth looking at in some way. Although I'm, I'm kind of reaching here because I don't really, I don't really know what the right questions are yet. I just feel like there's something in this space that'll be interesting. Uh, Greg, you had your hand up next and then I see Dana has a question. Um, yeah, I, I might be just like going over the same thing. Uh, but I see, I see. There's two aspects to this, and and you know, uh, so one aspect is um, the the related to the sustainability of the projects from the point of view of of um, I guess like the organisation or the funder or whoever it is that sort of has, owns that project, um, and. I think they want to know. So, so a lot of these projects are uh, a part of these organisations um, that are giving them, you know, they're funding them to some level. Um, and I think those organisations want to know how to allocate that funding. So, you know, would it make more sense to give this project more funding because, you know, they need help in this area or, or, and um, do we need to find additional funding for this project because it can't, you know, it needs a lot more help than we can possibly provide? All those sorts of questions, um, in addition to just getting a picture of, you know, what what the sustainability of so the, the community size and like all those different metrics, right? I think they I think they want to be able to see that and try and get some sort of picture of of the different projects that are that, that are part of their organizations and and what they look like from a sustainability perspective. So I think that's kind of what Dan was alluding to. But anyway, the other aspect I think is is the projects themselves want to um and uh want to understand more about their project, right? They want to know uh, how well they're doing from a testing perspective or their code, you know, coverage or their their coding practices or their CI or their documentation, you know, all those kinds of software engineering type things. I think the projects want to know that. Uh, they want to have more clarity into, uh, into, you know, what the projects look like from that perspective. So I think there's actually two kind of fairly independent aspects to to what we want to do with these metrics so um anyway thanks craig dana you have been patient yeah so <clears throat> i mean to me sustainability is is what happens when there's enough resources to support the project right so i mean there's i think that community and resources are all related that you know you can either you could have more volunteers or you can have money that flows in that's going to pay people directly to work on the software and things like that but also you can work on reducing the cost of ownership, right? It takes so much resources to maintain a project of a certain size. And so you can either bring in more people, right? To if you're trying to make yourself sustainable or you can reduce the cost, right? And that's where things like, you know, if you have good testing and CI and quality metrics and stuff like that, then it requires fewer resources to create a build or to fix bugs or, or whatnot. Um, one of the things that, that I'm, a, a bigger community can marshal more resources, whether that's volunteers or um, interest that brings in money from corporate sources, or maybe more people are available to have research grants where they can, you know, fund some part of development in the in the software. Um, but one of the things I'm interested in too is like, so you know, we've talked about like you know resources and metrics and stuff like that. But I'm curious about like, so if you're looking at metrics like health metrics, how fast do the communities go downhill? Like, what's the trajectory? Like, so if you start to see that a community is starting to have problems, like, at what stage in the slide is that, right? Where, you know, if you need to rescue a community, how much time do you have and things like that? I think that's kind of, that that's something that I'm interested in because do these things happen fast or do they happen slow? Do they 
how quickly can a, a robust community collapse? Mm -hmm. I think that's important, like for the DOE, right? If you're maintaining a big parcel of software and you're trying to maintain metrics on all of it, and you see that like, oh, there's like some key project that's having trouble, like how, long, how much time do you have? And I know Dan has a question, but to, to answer that, I would, I'd be interested in Don and Elizabeth's perspective on how fast can a robust community collapse because they've both, and I, maybe is Elizabeth still on the call or maybe she's yeah, here. Yep. Okay. Sorry. I, the, the way this looks on my screen, I, I don't see all the faces, but I know, you know, you've both lived in open source for, for like lived and breathed it for much longer than even matter I have. So I'm I'm just curious, um, how fast can a community collapse <laughs> from your, I mean, what have you seen What from your perspective or modes think, of collapse? Yeah, I think, I think it depends. I think, I think usually it's a slow decline. Um, there are some things that can cause um, more catastrophic kind of near, uh, you know, very short term collapses. And that would be, um, generally an extremely toxic personality that is in charge of the community. That's the only thing that I've seen really that can tank a community really, really quickly. Um, the other thing is like- scientists legal, are always good with people. Well, and, and legal <laughs> problems too. Like there, there's a relatively high profile project that um, the, the guy that runs it and the only person who had access to make uh, commits was thrown in jail. That's pretty instant. Um, and <laughs> it, it was, you know, the project didn't have any releases for nine months until they got out. Um, so there are things that can cause kind of instant, instant collapse. I would say, and Elizabeth can chime in here, I would say that's relatively rare. It's usually a slow decline where you have some time to fix things. I would agree. And I would just say the other time I have seen a community kind of collapse is, um, uh, a, a very large security flaw was discovered and it kind of just took down that project and others that were dependent on it. Um, so, um, but again, it's the bus factor really and how closely tied the project is to one or two personalities. Um, if, if it's more that people know the name of the people working on the project, then that's a risk, I think, because like Don said, anything can happen to them, they could get sick. They could have a baby and leave the project like that's it's really um, it can it can be really devastating but but yeah generally speaking most projects have enough folks to or they should strive to have enough folks to keep that from happening. And to make sure that the project goes uh, goes smoothly and um, that the, the community is um, still welcoming and, and not toxic because that is like Don said a, a huge factor is the toxicity of a community. The other thing that I've seen that I just remembered that that can also cause pretty instant collapse is um, when uh, whoever is in charge of this decides that it's not worth working on anymore. So I've seen it happen with company projects um, where the company is just like, nope, we're not going to do this anymore. And nobody really is around to, to take over. And um, something similar could happen in, in your space, right? Where, you know, the funding is cut for, for a thing and then nobody's working on the project anymore because nobody has... The grant funding to work on it. Licensing and, shifts too, right? Like Unity recently decided that the one of the companies that does video game stuff decided that they're going to change the the contributor license and to it, and or the the community license for it, and the whole field immediately decided they were never going to use Unity again. Yeah. And so that can be a big problem. Yeah. 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 License Dan, change is another one. Dan, you've been patient with your hand, and we've only got a couple minutes left, so. Yeah, so just really quickly in response to what Don was just saying, um, I, when I was a program officer, there was a, a PI that came to me and they said they were really concerned about sustainability of the software they were working on. And I asked them why, and 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 they said, well, we, we don't know where the money is going to come from to keep the developers. And, and I asked them, well, what would happen if if you stop, if your developers stopped working, what would the user community do? And their answer was, well, I think they'd figure out a way to keep the software going because they need it. And so from my point of view as a funder, that was not a sustainability problem, but for the, the person at the institution with the developers, it was. Um, so it's just, it, so the sustainability is kind of an interesting question that depends on your point of view. Um, the other the thing I was gonna say though, kind of going back to this resource question or this resource issue that Dana was bringing up is like, when we were doing the work in Corsa, one thing we were thinking about from the point of view of funders was 
was how they would make decisions on investing in projects with two different kinds of investments. Um, one being investing and in making the project better. Um, so making it more sustainable, uh, paying down technical debt, adding testing, whatever, whatever it is, versus actually just doing work. So like doing user support, for example, um, that's kind of separate from making it better. So there, so there were just these two different categories of kind of improve versus sustain. Yeah, and I would I would caution you that the users can just take it over because in in most cases that I've seen, the users don't have the skills to do that. They they may want to take it over because they really want to keep it around, but I I haven't seen a lot of cases where that's worked. Yeah, in in this case, it was one where it was it was very believable because it was like it was big institutions that were the users and they. Um, they were building software based on that software. And I think it was, I, I think the, the, I think it would have happened that way, actually. Yeah, it's definitely so a case. I, I agree with you in general. Yeah. Sorry, Greg, uh, go ahead. We are out of time, but I'll give Greg the last word. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that um, I think in, in our environment, um, what, what we really want to understand is, is uh, as well as all the things we've discussed, um, you know, the, the the importance of the projects to the ecosystem, because I don't think DO, if DOE, um, you know, thinks that a project or, or you know, has some uh, indication that a particular project is really important um, and, you know, is needed to achieve, uh, you know, whatever the, the goals of, of DOE are, um, they're not going to let that project fail. Uh, they will put money in it. So they want to know uh, which projects, you know, they need to fund. And this has happened many, many times. You know, there's there's a project called Flang at the moment, which is a Fortran project. You know, they they are funding that project. They know that they need to have uh, this, this software, um, even if the user base is small or whatever, but it's very important uh, because there's a lot of, you know, things that are, that rely on it. Um, and so they'll fund it. Um, and so I think that's another aspect for these uh, for these metrics is is providing that information um, so that so that DOE knows exactly which projects to fund. All right. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everybody. We're a little over time. Sorry about that. Um, before really we good start, to... before before oh. we shut the meeting down, I will. I, I'm in events for the next two weeks, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try to spend some more time thinking about what metrics might be useful for all of you. And so I will I'll spend some cycles on on that and maybe bring that back to uh, a meeting and uh maybe not the next one, but maybe the one after. Yeah. And we'll be together for the next week or so after this. So maybe we can chat over a beverage. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks everybody. Um Appreciate everybody participating and and uh, look forward to the next discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Thanks, everybody. everyone.